Desperate Times, the story of Mike Smith, the security guard. Cold sweat trickling down his neck and his hands shaking. Mike Smith waited in the upstairs office of Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria. The noise of cheering children echoing faintly from downstairs and the only other sound was the typing of the secretary at her desk, along with her occasional blowing and popping of her gum. He glanced at the clock. He was five minutes early for his meeting with the manager of this place. Was he the type of person who would value him for being early? Or would he be able to sense the desperation that Mike felt for how badly he needed this job? The pit of worry in Mike's stomach continued to churn and twist until he was certain it would burst out of him. He'd seen the advert in the paper after a week of desperate searching and rejections. While he'd hated his office clerk job, it was the only thing paying the bills, apart from his art commissions, but the latter was nowhere large enough to sustain him without an actual job. He was on his last $20 bill, he'd missed paying his rent twice, and he was barely scraping by for food. He needed a miracle. Not many people were willing to hire someone with a major in art. He'd found it in the jobs columns just this morning. Help wanted. Family Pizzeria looking for security guard to work the night shift, 12 a.m. to 6 a.m. Monitor cameras, ensure safety of equipment and animatronic characters, $120 a week. He didn't really care about the money. He'd done the math and found out that in tandem with the money he made from his art, this would help pick up the slack. Much to his astonishment, he called the number and they arranged a meeting with him that day. The secretary, Mel, had told him to wait until the manager is ready to see him. Mike had just worn his old suit from work. It hadn't been washed for a couple of days and it smelled. He'd given his hair a quick comb over and he'd shaved with a cheap razor. At least the cuts were drying up by now. He'd be amazed if anyone in their right mind would hire him looking the way he did. Mel seemed to be thinking the same from how she'd given him the once over before telling him to sit. Mike had all his fingers crossed. This had to work. It had to. The door to the manager's office opened and Mike shot to his feet. A portly man in a gray suit emerged from the office. He greeted Mike with a firm handshake and a welcoming smile. Ah, Mr. Smith, we meet at last, he said jovially. I am Aaron Johnson, manager of Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria. It's a pleasure, sir, Mike stammered politely. Come on in, please, take a seat. Mike slumped into the seat, trying to wipe off a few beads of sweat without him noticing. Things seem to be going well so far. So, Mike, applying for the position of night watchman, are you? Y yes, sir, he answered, trying to speak as confidently as he could. I could, uh, really use the job, sir. That's the kind of attitude we want, Mr. Johnson said heartily. Congratulations, Mike, you're hired. Mike's mouth fell open. Had he heard Mr. Johnson say what he think he just heard him say? And barely a minute into the interview? Really? He asked, hardly daring to believe it. Indubitably, he chuckled. I think you're just what we're looking for, Mike, my lad. Let me just draw up the contract here. Mike had a hard time fighting the grin off his face while Mr. Johnson rifled through a few papers. A small part of him argued that this was far too easy, that he'd barely asked him any questions. But he silenced that part of him with a mental whooping. All it would take now was for him to sign this. Please, he begged, please don't let this be some sort of cruel joke. Mr. Johnson handed him a contract. A quick scan told Mike that he was to be held in contract for five days mandatory employment. After that, he had a choice to sign on permanently or seek other work. It was for $4 an hour, but Mike would take it. Desperate times called for desperate measures, and it was only one little stumble. With a flourish, he signed in his name and handed the contract back, clapping his hands together heartily. Mr. Johnson stood up and shook his hand across the desk. Welcome aboard, my lad, he boomed. Thank you, sir. Mike could no longer hide the smile that broke out on his face. Thank you so much. No, thank you, my boy, he replied sincerely. You go on and wait outside. I'll get your uniform and give you a lay of the land. Mike nodded quickly and left the office. It was all he could do to avoid fist bumping the air in triumph. You got the job, huh? Remarked the secretary snidely. Mike didn't say anything. He just nodded, partly because he was elated at his success and luck, also because he'd never really been one for talking to women well. That and Mel didn't come across as friendly. Heh, <laughs> she snickered. Good luck. Thanks. But, um, how hard can it be? He tried to say positively. Mel merely smirked at him from her desk and went back to typing, chewing her gum loudly. Mike tried his best to ignore her. 
She was probably just trying to make him nervous because he was new. Wouldn't be the first time. Mr. Johnson emerged from his office moments later. He carried a plastic washing bag with some freshly washed clothes that consisted of a blue shirt with the restaurant's logo on the back, black pants, a belt, and a torch, keys, handcuffed, and a taser attached, and a black cap, kind of like what a mall cop would wear. This will be your uniform, he told him, pressing it into his chest. You might be on the night's watch, my lad, but that doesn't mean you can't look presentable. Uh, of course, sir, Mike stuttered. He clutched the uniform, still with a bit of a grin. Eager to get started, eh? He clapped Mike on the back. That's the way, lad. Come on, I'll show you where you'll be working. Still rivaling in utter relief, Mike closely followed him back downstairs. He led him to a small room near the two front doors. Two doors led into the room with a pair of buttons next to them, one labeling light and the other door. The office itself was nothing remarkable. A few blank monitors were stationed on the desk, a set of speakers under it, and a phone on the wall. There was some crumpled paper, an empty soda can, an office fan, a black laptop looking device connected with a cord to the socket, and some things posted on the walls. One was a big poster depicting the restaurant's mascots, and there were a few little kids' drawings on them as well. This will be your office, Mr. Johnson explained. It's an easy enough job. He patted the black laptop. This here is your security monitor. Just flip it open and you can see the whole restaurant without having to leave the comfort of this chair. You see anything during the night that's suspicious? You give them what for. Um, right. A little nervousness took Mike again. He'd never been one for fights. Mr. Johnson saw his apprehension and chuckled. Don't worry, lad. This restaurant's not had a break-in in over 10 years. You should be fine. Probably be bored all night, but it doesn't hurt to be prepared. Eh? Y yes, sir. Exactly. Now, a bit of fair warning. We have been having a little problem concerning cash recently, so to save money, we allocate a small amount of the restaurant's power for use at night. Since you're the only one here, he elaborated, now that means that the lights won't be very bright, and you have to be mindful of how you use your power. Your monitor, the lights, and these security doors, they all use power. Security doors? asked Mike. Security doors. To demonstrate, Mr. Johnson hit the door button and Mike yelped as a metal hydraulic door slammed into place. Another press and it slid back up. In case there are any break-ins or things get a little hairy for you, just get these shut and ring up the police on the phone. But sir, he paused until Mr. Johnson nodded for him to continue, if the power's limited and I run out, Ah, smart one you are, complimented Mr. Johnson. Don't you worry about that, lad. If the power runs out, there's an emergency failsafe on the doors that make them open so that you can get back out. As for the police, the station is just up the road, so they'd be here in no time. Don't you worry, lad. You'll be fine. <sighs> Thank you, sir. Not at all, Mike. Not at all, he chuckled. Let me show you who exactly you'll be guarding. He led Mike toward the main body of the restaurant. The curtains had been shut to provide darkness for the show in here, and the scent of freshly cooked pizza was making Mike's stomach rumble. Collections of excited, cheering children all directing their attention at the brightly lit stage illuminated in the dark. Moving jerkily on the stage were three animatronic animals. They all had roughly the same bodies, just with different coloration and different heads. A dark purple rabbit with a bass guitar wearing a big red bow tie, a weird duck wearing a bib and a cupcake in her hand, and a brown bear on center stage with a microphone and a small black top hat. Though the kids were cheering with glee, Mike couldn't but feel slightly unsettled. Maybe it was to do with their jerky movements, their large teeth, or their large yet dead looking eyes. Whatever it was, they gave Mike the creeps. Quite something, aren't they? Yes, yes, sir, Mike agreed, though he wasn't sure what that something was. The kids might be the life and soul of this place, but those three are the heart, he remarked wistfully. That's what I'm trusting you with here, Mike, the heart of this place. It'll be your responsibility to make sure nothing happens to these three while the doors are closed. Keep an eye on them. Make sure they don't go anywhere, that they don't do anything. Just take good care of them, and they'll take good care of you. Mike wanted to say something. He wanted to say they were just machines and that taking care of them would be nothing challenging. How exactly were they going to take care of him if he did? What did he mean by that? But the tone of Mr. Johnson's voice told him that he said a lot by them. Whether it was nostalgia or something to do with humans forming attachments to things, he didn't know. Either way, he nodded solemnly. I'll do my best, sir, he promised. It means a great deal to hear that from you, Mike. Mr. Johnson patted his shoulder. I'll let you get on your way. Your shift starts at 12. So make sure you're here sharp to lock up. Get me? 
Understood, sir, Mike replied. Good man, and good luck, he wished, strolling on back to his office. Mike watched him go and looked at his uniform again. He grinned once more that he had a job again, that he might finally earn some money, and it was in a nice little place like this, even if the robots were kind of freaky. Things were definitely starting to look up, until a shiver went down Mike's spine. Looking around, he saw nothing, just the kids, the parents, and the characters on stage. His eyes stopped traveling around the room and lingered on the stage. He held them, blinked a couple times, but brushed it off. It was probably nothing, he told himself, just seeing things. Even so, he could have sworn that for a brief second there, Bonnie wasn't looking out at the crowd. Instead, she was looking at the back of the room, right at Mike. You kids can't breathe. When you're eating, kids, remember to have plenty of kids. Green, 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 plenty of green vegetables, kids. And don't all you young bunnies need to have your, your, your carrots. Health is important if you want to live, 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 live. Have a fun and happy children. Fun and happy time. Very fast. <laughs> I remember that Foxy would always say, 